I'm going to be brief because I've been around for a long time. I've been just talking to the whole half an hour and giving that background. I started as a programmer for HP a long time ago. And from there, I became an entrepreneur. I've started four or five companies, depending on how you count. And you know, one of those companies got bought, and I became an executive at a large company, then at a small company again. That company got bought, and after that, I became an investor and an advisor to startups. And sort of in that time frame, I became a partner at Y Combinator about eight years ago. And since then, I've been at YC. Awesome. And YC has really been based in Silicon Valley, but you all- well, we started in Cambridge, actually. Oh, okay. So talking about building startups outside of Silicon Valley, the, the really sort of super condensed story of YC is that Paul Graham gave this talk at the Harvard Computing Society in Cambridge, Massachusetts, called How to Start a Startup. And from then, from that, uh, him and his then girlfriend, now wife, Jessica Livingston, decided to start something called the Summer Founders Program, which took place in Cambridge. And that was the first batch of YC in the spring of 2005. Awesome. So, so we started in so we started outside of Silicon Valley, but a Cambridge. year later we moved to Mountain View, and we've been there ever since. Yeah. So speaking of that, just kind of thinking through that story, curious, what was the pool to Silicon Valley, and what kind of has has kept YC in Silicon Valley for all these years? You know, it's, it's a good question. What's the pull of Silicon Valley for startups? What's the magic in Silicon Valley yeah. that has made it such an extraordinarily fertile place to start startups? Well, Paul, PG, saw that that was the place. You know, he had, he had started a couple of startups before Y Combinator, and he just knew, he just had the sense that the future of most startups in that time frame were going to, you know, was going to start in Silicon Valley. So it made sense for him to move out. In fact, they sort of just came out and didn't really have a place to stay. And luckily, one of the co-founders of Y Combinator was also starting a robotics company called AnyBots. And he had lots of extra space in this kind of strange building at uh, 320 Pioneer Way in Mountain View. And we actually still are in that building to this day. We have another building across the street because we We've expanded, but ever since then, they've uh, been in Silicon Valley. What do you think are those magic pieces that need to be potentially recreated or are necessary in the other places where folks are starting their businesses? I don't know what you guys think, but one of the things that makes starting a business in Silicon Valley so natural and so normal is, uh, I call it sort of the salad bar effect, which is, you know, imagine you go into a a grocery store and you're just going to grab a, a salad bar because you have no time to do anything else for dinner because you, you're doing a startup and so you have no time for anything. And you're sitting there making it yourself and you bump into someone you know. And in Silicon Valley, you, you sort of, the conversation naturally goes to someone, what are you doing? And you know, I'm starting a startup and they're like, yeah, so am I, that's awesome, that's great. And you start talking and maybe they are, maybe they're not, but it's so exciting to be doing a startup. But so many other places, of the country and in the world, if you if you tell someone you're starting a startup, they'll be like, oh, damn, couldn't you get a job? Are you okay? <laughs> and, and you know, that may be a bit a, a bit of an exaggeration, but there is something in the air, in the water, in the soil of Silicon Valley that makes it natural, that, that makes it okay to do something that has such a high chance of failure, that is so difficult. And you know, pay so little until it doesn't, right? And so there is there is this this sense here that starting a startup is a viable, real, powerful alternative for your career. And uh, that's not necessarily true in other places. Now, we also, of course, have Sand Hill Road here, which is shorthand for venture money. And Startups need fuel, they need that money, and there is a lot of it here. It started because back in 1957, this strangely named firm called ARDC invented, it invested $70,000 in this company that, actually, who knows, who's heard of Digital Equipment Corporation, DAP? Yeah? Well, they were one of the early computer companies, and they invested $70,000 in that company. When they went public, they made $35 million. It's pretty good, right? And a lot of people saw that and said, that's pretty good. And they came out to Sand Hill Road, which 
you know, that's where they were, and that's where a lot of these companies were being started because, you know, Stanford and Berkeley and the other universities that are in the local areas. You had lots of people who had the skills necessary to start companies. And so that's part of what makes Silicon Valley special. But, but of course, there's great universities around the world, and there's availability of funds around the world and around the country. So those things aren't nearly as special as that special culture that I think is getting built in, in other places around the, around the world and the country. Yeah, I think so too. But you should go where your startup has the best chance of success. That usually means where your customers are. So if your customers are all in New York, maybe you should go there. The, the, the Airbnb guys in 2009, they were never in Mountain View. They were always in New York because their early customers were in New York. And of course, look, it didn't matter where they were and they ended up uh, based <laughs> everywhere, but based in their company in San Francisco. But they could have been anywhere. So you do want to go where your customers are. That's maybe because uh, I hope some of you have seen the, the blog post that myself and Michael Seibel wrote called the Essential Startup Advice. And there's some really basic, but I think good advice in there, like, you know, talk to your customers. What can I tell you? Seek competition. This is a story about a guy named Noah Kalina, took a photograph of himself every single day for five years. No reason why, particularly. He just got really into this, didn't tell anyone, was a struggling photographer in Brooklyn, you know, just trying to figure it out. <laughs> One day, he comes across a blog entry of another photographer, a woman who had been taking a photograph of herself every day for two years, and she's talking about how she's going to debut it in a gallery and how brilliant this is, and he says, no way is she going to beat me to the punch. And so in a one-week time frame, he puts together this YouTube video of every photograph in succession, puts it up on YouTube, it becomes one of the most viewed YouTube videos of all time. His platform as a photographer, he's on the morning shows and the cover of magazines, and he points back to this impetus to act as the most important thing for his career potential. And the impetus to act oftentimes comes from competition. And so whatever you're doing, and a lot of startups I meet say if they don't have any competitors or they're not focused on that or only focused on what they want to build, I don't buy it. I actually think that the impetus to act is one of the things that actually forces you to optimize everything that works. So if you don't see the competition, seek the competition. Okay, so we're here at day two of uh, Startup Grind. It's been a really good morning so far. Again, the sun is shining and uh, very busy outside the main theater. I'm you know, the CEO and co-founder of Fan Food. As a diehard sports fan, there's nothing more frustrating than missing a big play because you're stuck waiting in a line for a hot dog and beer. Fan food keeps you in the moment. Our mobile ordering app allows fans to order concessions from their seat and get it delivered, or they can order it ahead for express pickup at various concession stands. We're in over 75 venues to date, from high schools to Division I colleges, most notably University of North Carolina, Tennessee, Washington State University, um, Durham Bulls, minor league uh, baseball park in North Carolina, and many more. The purpose of me being here today is obviously to uh, interact and meet with investors. We're at 75 today, we want to get to 500 tomorrow. Um, the best way to get in contact with me is uh, my email. Uh, you can reach me at carson at fanfoodapp.com. Again, my email is carson at fanfoodapp.com. Thank you. Uh, Tony Cap shouldn't exist. Funny cap shouldn't exist because we live off the inefficiencies of healthcare. We are aggregating the best digital resources in a single mobile platform for doctors and their patients. On the other hand, we're giving access to this medical community to all other healthcare players. Some of our clients are, for example, Novartis, IQVIA, or Medronic, some of the largest healthcare companies in, uh, in the world. So, uh, if you want to know more, Please visit us at the Chase in Tent, booth 152, or uh, email me at daniela at tonicapp.com. I'm a medical doctor and the CEO of the company. Thank you so much. But do you know what I hate about traveling? I hate stressing about roaming fees. And I hate trying to find a local SIM card after a long haul flight and use my earring to try to change it. This doesn't need to happen anymore because here is a relic. You can now go to our app and you can purchase a digital SIM card and it works exactly the same way as you would have gotten a physical SIM card inserted into your phone. You can now be connected to local networks in minutes with that completely hassle-free and it's so easy to use. 
You can now, if you come to the MailChimp booth as you walk in, just to the right you can meet us. And we've got 45,000 active customers in only five months. So if you want to go and say goodbye to Romy, you should come and see us in our tent today. Thank you. Probably advising you guys on how to find product market fit, which is definitely the number one thing that startups have to do. But what I thought I had spent my time doing is walking through um, reasons, I think there's about 10 of them that I've kind of cataloged here, uh, that pitfalls that startups often you know, fall into uh, so that you guys can maybe avoid some of these problems. And so this, this presentation is called How Not to Go Off the Rails. Uh, I'm just going to kind of walk through some of these things. So number one is the problem of negative gross margins, negative unit economics. We've seen this a lot lately with so-called tech-enabled businesses, businesses that operate in the physical world. And a business that has negative unit economics is basically selling a product for less than what it costs. So they're losing money, not just at kind of the corporate level, because basically every startup is unprofitable, but they're actually losing money on every trade. It's a question about you know, doing the uh, cultural uh, norms of doing the right thing. Uh, under data, we actually have been extremely, you know, rigid and careful about following, you know, rules and regulations and do the right thing by our riders and drivers and our uh, policy makers, and that's what focus on. But from the technology standpoint, uh, we still move incredibly fast and break lots of things all the time when it comes to the product stack. Right? It looked really calm on the service because you opened the app and it seemed to work all the time. But yeah, we are launching you know, thousands of uh, changes to that live site every single day with that kind of velocity, whether it's configuration changes or code changes or feature launches or experimentation. Uh, and uh, many of those things uh, don't work well in Brent, but you have to learn from that breakage and you move forward uh, you know, very fast and, and course correct on those things. But those things are completely invis mostly invisible. Uh, to the uh, to the public who actually use our service, and for us in technology, uh, we're still moving incredibly fast, and, and, and we do break ourselves lots of times. Uh, sometimes multiple times during a day. Uh, so now the, the the key message from Darren Kostrichani lately has been about the path to profitability. Is technology going to take you to profit? Abs absolutely, technology is one key part of that. Right now. And for a company this diverse and this large, uh, there is no single bullet. Uh, I think that many parts of the company has to be part of that solution. For example, uh, if you give uh, away, if you give too much incentive, then you burn too much money, and you're very far away from profitability. If you uh, don't offer any incentive at all, then you lose market share and you can't grow. Right. So that's on the business side, and on the operation side, how efficient you are, how much more you can do with what you have. You know, increase yeah, our effectiveness, our capability, our leverage, right, and and our uh, and improve our bottom line. And from the product and technology perspective, incredibly important because getting to profitability alone uh, is is not the only thing we worry about. We are worried about getting to getting to profitability while driving sustained growth for years and decades to come. One day you might be profitable. In fact, if you look at our earning uh, in our ride sharing. We already demonstrate that we are uh, profitable, right? Now there are other parts of business that are fast growing still that we have to fund as a company, that uh, that cause us to be overall um, not quite profitable yet, but we already put the marker down. Where Dara already uh, promised the world that by the uh, Q4 of this year, 2020, uh, for that quarter we will reach profitability. You had you had 100,000 active communities, uh, which is is just staggering. Um, like, what metrics inside of that are important health indicators for you as to active, obviously, like, probably means there's people using it at certain you know, intervals that are acceptable to be deemed active, but, like, what is actually a healthy community inside of Reddit look like? It's, it's, it's funny, you've used a lot of words in there that are important to us that maybe you didn't even realize. One, you said like these are your public numbers, and that's totally true, because when we think about our, the numbers we operationalize on, um, our internal numbers, those are always changing. And we do, have, um, we do have operational numbers, like metrics that we track around active communities, but we have an internal definition of what an active community is. For a while, we actually had an internal definition or tried to have a definition of what a healthy community was. 
I actually think we switched the word from healthy to active because it was a little less judgy. Um, so anyway, um, there's all sorts of, and I think it's actually really, this is really hard. Um, you know, the, the numbers that we care about um, on the surface are users, communities, revenue, uh, but those are really output metrics. And there's all sorts of things that, uh, that feed into those. Um, and we can start getting into quality versus quantity, and um, long story short, I think metrics are really important, but they're only one side of the story. Right, they're really what we're trying to capture with metrics, whether they're internal or external, is we're trying to give people a sense of the direction we're going or give a sense of what's important to us. Um, but it's really easy, I think, at a company, and a lot of companies make this mistake of you know, chasing a number just for the number's sake and, and losing track of the, the reason for doing so.